worshiping the Lord. Now, I know I'm talking about A.M. I'm not trying to exalt him, but there's something that, that, that a lot of the people that in those days have followed his ministry. And I thought, Lord, this is so wonderful. The people were so inspired, and it was such a God thing, that many of the people were fasting and praying. Many of the people. It wasn't just A.A. A. Allen that was fasting and praying. It was, it was people. I can remember listening to the radio and hearing on the radio as I was driving you know, around the country before I married Rhonda. And I, I would hear him preaching on the radio. And he would announce, we're going to have such and such a meeting in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, or wherever. And he would announce there's going to be like a, a, a two weeks of fasting and sometimes three weeks of fasting. There was a lot of prayer and fasting during those times, a lot of it. And, uh, and this man that I interviewed, he told me that out there, at Mir they call it Miracle Valley, Arizona, that's where they had a Bible school, and he, he shared with me, he said, he said that so many of the students and people that, that came out that were part of that, they, they had to actually go on a 40-day fast. And they, now I'm not telling you to go on a 48-day fast. It has to be God telling you to do any, any kind of fasting, but I think that should be part of our lifestyle. Yeah. It's prayer and fasting. And, uh, and I do that myself, and, and, uh, and, I, and I enjoy doing that. But uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 17. So now I realize that not everyone is going to be an A.A. Allen or... Uh, an Oral Roberts or a William Branham or some other, uh, you know, ministry that's uh, whatever God has called us to be. There are people, they have their, their, their jobs, they go to the shipyard and uh, uh, carpentry, construction workers, office workers, school teachers, working in the hospital, whatever kind of jobs there are. You know, the Bible says that the Lord's commandments, they are not grievous. Now, they, they told me to go to 12, 15, 12, 30, something like that, right? And I want to be, make this Matthew 17 uh, try to get the real important points here. On June 15th, some of you may have heard me say this. Have you ever had the experience where someone, you were asleep and someone walked into your room talking? and you were awakened from your sleep by their talking? Well, on June 15th, that happened with me, but it was, it was God that came into, into our bedroom. June 15th, real early in the morning, it's, I, I don't know, it was somewhere around between three and four o'clock, and then, and I was awakened by the audible voice of God, hearing God talking. And when I opened up my eyes, I could not see the walls of the bedroom or anything in the bedroom. I could not see anything, but all that I could see was this brilliant kind of a golden light that I was, that I was inside this light. It was on me, all around me, and just such uh, presence, power, anointing, and glory of God. It was so strong, surging, surging, surging went through me. So, so strong, physically, the glory of God. And as I was having this experience in, in a physical way, because there are times that people, they, they experience the, uh, what's the word, uh, tangible anointing and of God's presence. And I believe that we need more and more in these days for the church in America is to have what we would call a God encounter. I believe that God wants to bring God encounters even for whole congregations at one time. Where it's not just one here and there that, that's getting that. Whole congregations. Where the anointing of God would come at times to visit even a whole church. Where the spirit and the glory of God is just sweeping through like a mighty wind. There was 120 on the day of Pentecost that happened too. And the wind of God, they heard the, the wind, and they saw the cloven tongue of like the fire. And what happened with those people that were visited by God, 
that day of Pentecost. But in, in this June 15, the Lord said this to me. Uh, he said, coordinated prayer and fasting brings forth the fullness of his spirit. And then I said, and as I was uh, in the glory of God, God began to show me all across America that there are many churches, that it's like they're dead and there's such a lack of the presence. There's a lack of the anointing of God. Just, you know, just having church, you know, one, two, three. And, and going home and coming back, same, basically the same thing again, but there just seems to be like there's something lacking. That I want more than just this one, two, three, four. If we're not careful, we can become mechanical. We need to have those suddenlies from the Lord. When we come together, that we are ready for the suddenlies of the Lord. Do a Bible study sometime about the suddenlies of the Lord. That's in the Bible. Suddenly, the suddenlies. I experience that in personal ways. I've been going along doing my own thing. And all of a sudden, unexpectedly, but expectantly, suddenly, the Lord shows up in a powerful way. I, you know, I, when I went to sleep that night, I never knew that there was going to be that suddenly of the Lord in, in the early morning hours. And he gave me that Exodus 29, 43, that the tabernacle will be sanctified by my glory. If we can have good preaching, good teaching, and seemingly good worship, the right songs, and all, and yet be lacking in the glory of God. That's right. And we need to have uh, that desire. I said, Lord, I'm prophesying this morning what I'm going to be speaking on. <laughs> but I was feeling the anointing. Boom. The anointing and the glory of God. When the glory of God is that manifest glory of God, sinners will come under conviction of sin. And, and, and believers, they have things that need to be repented of. They will be repenting of that. And the preacher's going there, saying, man, I preach about this. I preach my guts out on this, I don't know how many times. And nothing's happened. And all of a sudden, there's this glory of God that shows up and wow. And we need good teaching, we need good preaching, but we need the presence and the glory of God. Mm -hmm. I like the David says, early will I seek thee, that I may see thy glory and thy power. I remember when I was in fellowship with the people in the Baptist church, and they, they, they were always talking about, the early church has something that we don't have. And they're always talking that way, what we don't have, what we don't have, we don't have. And I thought, well, I got so tired, of hearing that, what we don't have. And I was getting desperate with God. And I started praying. I said, Lord, I don't know what this is that we don't have. I don't know what they're talking about. But they keep saying, the early church has something we don't have. Lord, I don't want to live the rest of my life as a don't have Christian. I don't want to be a negative Christian the rest of my life. Boy, what wonderful what testimony that leaves. Hey, I'm a negative Christian. You know, hey, sister, I had an early church had something I don't have. Mm -hmm. Would you like to listen to me? Would you like to receive from me? I don't have. No. <laughs> well, I'm glad you get it. She said, no. <laughs> and I don't blame you. I'm going to be like Peter and John. Such as I have, give I thee. Yeah. And we can look at ourselves and ask ourselves. I ask myself, Bobby Marsh, what do you have? And what do you have to give to the people? And if you don't have, you need to get before God and wait on God until you have something to give to the people. Yes. I was praying that just even before coming up here. I said, Father, I can't give to these people unless you give to me. I don't want to go there and just get up in front and just flop my mouth around and just a place to preach and pick up some money and go on. I'm not interested in that. I'd rather go shovel manure in the barnyard than be like that. And I saw in that all across America churches they're going to experience God's glory. Prayer and fasting. You know, I have 